I understand that this is designed for seven degrees in our area, and sometimes it gets to zero, but that's okay. But when it gets to zero, they're not okay. <laughs> I can I can tell you they're not okay um, because they call here. So you you know you you have to be careful. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Rich Lavoie, General Manager for Central Heating and Cooling in Woburn, Massachusetts. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Leave feedback and ask questions there too. Rich, thanks a million for being on the show, man. Thanks for having me, Patrick. It's great to be here. Um, can you please tell me a little bit about the business you work for? Yeah, so it's actually central cooling and heating. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, family-owned business. We've been around since 1966. Um, I've been here myself for 34 years. Started out Did you start the, out uh, there at that same company? Yeah. Yeah, yeah my wow. Whole, my whole professional career has, has been here. Um, started out as a service technician um, and worked my way up. But, but getting back to us, we're a... Um, Residential HVAC contractor, so about 75 employees. Um, as you said, we're about 10 miles north of Boston. Um, and we do an area probably about 20 miles around um, north of Boston, let's say. Metro is it West. mostly and, service work or is it equipment replacement and or new systems? Or is uh, it a mix? About a, uh, about a third of the business is uh, service. And then the other two thirds are, uh, you know, replacement type work. Uh, very little very little home building. Um, we, we do have some, some, some high end custom home builders that we work with, but for the most part, we're staying out of the, the new home building world. Um, just not, we're not a good fit for, for that. Um, I, I can guess it's because it doesn't pay enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would guess correct. Uh, you know, you, when, when you're working for home builders, obviously you don't, you don't control the process. You're, you're, and again, there's great. There's some great people out there. We we have a lot of relationships we've made in the past, but it's just not a good fit for us anymore. We, you know, as as companies mature, they 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 you know they you, you really have to know what you're good at, and you know at the end of the day, um, you have to make money if you are going to provide great support. And HVAC is you know it, it, there's a there's a there's a lot of obviously a lot of support after you install something. Um, you got to make money so you can you can uh, pr provide those um, you know take provide, good care of your clients quality. right if if you, yeah yeah, that, yeah. That. so I I think that's important. So we were introduced because you wrote into the uh, Fine Home Building podcast email, and I'd like to read a little bit of what you wrote because it's it's it was well written. Uh, good morning, FHB podcast. I've been a reader of FHB magazine going back at least twenty years. Subscribed to the online version about two years ago. And, two years ago, and it's a rare night that I'm not scanning the forum to see what's going on. Recently, I became hooked on the FHB podcast to pass the time on my commutes, and you guys do a great job. I get the sense that HVAC contractors have a reputation in the FHB slash GBA world for being difficult, uncouth, and unwilling to change. I've been in the HVAC business for 34 years, starting out as a technician, moving into residential sales, commercial sales, service manager, and now general manager. In that time, I have met many that would fit that description. However, many more that are very sharp, caring, and eager to deliver the best HVAC design service or installations possible. So uh, what made you want to write in and challenge our perceptions, uh, rightly or wrongly, as they may be? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, at your, listening to your podcast and, and you know, going on, going on the FHB forum as well as some other forums, and I see that. Um, you obviously, you know, you and, and, um, GBA, um, appeal to a, to a, um, a more, let's say sophisticated, um, you, you know, viewer and, um, obviously into building, you know, high performance and, and building science and, um, you know, I chuckle when I when I go through the forum. Sometimes, you know, I, I I can I can I can see what's going on because obviously I'm I'm on I, I see both sides of the HVAC world, and you know it, it's not unusual for us to be in a a fairly new home or or facing a fairly new installation done by somebody else that 
Doesn't Wait work. The customer needs to come out. Can't yeah. it can't work. It'll never work because it's it's too big. The duct works too small. It was poorly installed. It can't be serviced. What you know, what have you? So I see that you know daily, really, and uh, so I, I I get both sides of it. But you know, getting back to what I said earlier, you know, HVAC is very complicated, and and again, I'm not going to disparage plumbers or electricians or anyone else, but when I say this, but you know, if you if you if you hire a plumber and he replaces a toilet or he, you know you, you the toilet flushes and it doesn't leak water, then they're all largely the it, same. <laughs> it, looks, it looks good, then, then it's a successful yeah. mission, you know, a su- successful outcome. With HVAC, you know, we're, we're dealing with not only installing it correctly, which anyone that you know that hires an HVAC person should expect it to be installed per the uh, manufacturer's installation instructions, no question. It should be sized properly, um, no question. But we get into all these other, you know, areas of, of, of comfort and sound and odor and building performance and efficiency and expectations and controls. And that's kind of where it, it gets really difficult. <laughs> and, you know, you, you got to remember that the average HVAC person that, you know, has some entrepreneurial spirit and wants to get out there and you know, put, hang out their own shingle, they might be a great technician, they might be a great sheet metal installer, but they didn't necessarily get all this other, you know, knowledge. Um, you, you know, unfortunately, you learn a lot of that stuff the hard way. And by things that don't work, right? You see what yeah, doesn't yeah, work, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, and, and the key here is if, 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 you, if you're the cheapest HVAC guy or the cheapest plumber or whatever, um, and, you know, you're just scraping by, there is no money to go back. <laughs> so, right. so when the phone when when the phone calls go unanswered, it might not be because they're bad people. It might be because they're afraid to pick up the phone because they can't afford to go back to the house. You know, and and they might have installed it correctly, and they can't afford to go back because there's just nothing left. You know, I I uh, I asked an HVAC technician one time. It's like, why is stuff so routinely oversized? And he told me it's because I get the call because the insulation cavity wasn't filled by the insulation contractor, or there's no air barrier up in the attic uh, crawl space where this system is installed. And I have to make my equipment at least perform to some degree in these with these unforeseen circumstances. And I, that was very thought provoking to me. I'm, yeah. I'm, and it, you're the one. It's they're the client is not going to call the framer back because they're missing an air barrier, right? No. And, and I look back at my career and for the, for the first, I'm going to say for the first 15 or 20 years, we, we spent an awful lot of our money and my, you know, my grief and my headaches <laughs> fixing building, building envelope problems with, with just more heating yeah. Well, more cooling. And, you know, and the reality was it was a it was a it was a, a, a poor building envelope or poor design or, you know, um, bad insulation, what have you. But but, you know, and that's that's really really been eye opening. You know, a, again, we're a bigger company. We have a lot more resources. You know, we can send our people to to, um, you know, um, whatever, you know, uh, trainings, training and, and you know, uh, whatever, HERS rating training and BPI training and, and, you know, but, but, you, but as a, you know, a, a one or two person HVAC shop, you just, you just can't, it's, it's, you can, but it's very, very difficult. And sure. It doesn't, it doesn't get done. That knowledge isn't learned necessarily. So uh, are HVAC techs getting a better training than when you started on building science and these issues that can affect heating and cooling that we, we, we talk about it a lot more as, as you know, our leadership team, uh, we're aware of building science. Obviously we, we talk about it, but, um, you, I, I think sometimes there's only so much bandwidth and, 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 you know, a, a person's, you know, if you're not really curious and interested in some of that stuff, it, it, you know, it, it, it it's difficult to sink in mm-hmm. and, you know, they do have their plates full with just trying to stay ahead of, the latest and greatest equipment out there. Um, you know, it was when I came up through the trades, it was a lot different. The, the equipment was a, a lot simpler, and there wasn't such a variety of it. 
um, now. And this stuff is all very highly electronic now, I think you'd agree, right? So you Absolutely. have to be a diagnostician. Right. And we can talk about that at some point. But, you know, you look at some of these, some of these, um, you know, ductless systems. And, you know, it, it, if you open up one of those outdoor units, it, it's like, you know, three or four computers, <laughs> you know, in an outdoor car. It's like a modern car. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that's really, you know, there has to be, usually there has to be uh, factory technical support to figure out what's actually going on. So, you know, a lot of the technicians time is spent, you know, with, with talking to, with, you know, a tech rep about what's going on. And, um, you know, you didn't see that when I was, when I was coming up through the, through the ranks, we would just, you know, figure it out, replace a part and move on. And, um, and, customer, and the stuff was it, simple, right? I mean, it mechanically, it was, it was very, and, very and simple. Certainly customer expectations were a lot lower in my in my day. That, you know, was, they were happy not to be freezing. Yeah, put another blanket <laughs> on, and we'll see you in the morning. And that was customer service. And you know, obviously, it's a lot different now with with you know wearing shoe protection and putting down drop cloths as we walk in. And you know, it's just a whole different expectation nowadays. Can you talk about how you were trained in the in your early part of your career for me? What was what was that like? How long did it take? What yeah, made you want to no, enter this fortunate. field? I was fortunate to go to a, um, a, a, a an old time trade school in Boston, and um, I, was that part of the public school system? No, no, it was a um, it was something I paid for. I, I was actually when I got out of high school, I was painting houses during the day and going to HVAC refrigeration school at night, paying paying my own way. And um, but it was a great a great foundation for me. It got you know, it, um, obviously, um, it. it um, uh, got me, got me hooked on HVAC. Now, this is 1980, 1987 probably. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I, you know, I, I realized pretty quickly in my training that I, you know, I should have a, a, a daytime job that's HVAC related and not, not painting. So I, I found a job. I actually found it here as a helper. And, um, so I started out as a service technician. Um, you know, I did that for seven, eight years. Um, and then that's gotta be a hard job. Can I ask you a little bit about your time doing that? Sure. I mean, customers are uncomfortable. They're hard to deal with. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they can be, um, yeah, you know, I, I love, I love, I, I, I love solving problems. I, you know, I, I think mechanically, um, and I, so I, I really enjoyed the job. Um, you know, the difficulties are obviously customers can be, um, you know, uh, upset when they have no heater, especially no cooling. Uh, That's what my uncle, who was a carrier dear Lord, always said, like, people could tolerate being cold, but boy, they didn't like being cold. Well, yeah, you can put another blanket you know, on, but it's really tough yeah. to cool down if it's, you know, 100 degrees and humid out. Um, so that's certainly true. Um, but, um, but you know, lear learning, um, learning how stuff works, seeing it in action, uh, learning, learning customer service. Uh, you know, th those are, those are the, the, you know, the skills that prepared me to, in my next, you know, move of my career into sales. Um, and, um, but technicians, you know, they, they have it, they have it difficult. They're, they're working out in the weather. Obviously it's hotter, it's cold. Uh, they're under stress because, you know, the customer a lot of times is, is, um, Watching even, though them. The <laughs> yeah, they, even though the customers see the technician as the, the savior, um, they want it done quickly and they, they don't want to spend a lot of money. So there's that stress. Um, and, um, and then you're on call and, and, you know, and that's, that's probably the biggest stress is the fact that, you know, any HVAC company is going to have an on-call schedule, you know, you know, the emergency service and, um, and that's always hanging over you on your, you know, on your, your time off when you're, you know, waiting for that, that phone call to, uh, to, to, to ring. Um, do you, do you just like spread those responsibilities around amongst your team i'm guessing i'm guessing you have to right yeah you know we we uh now our um our customer service people are on call uh first uh and generally if they can talk to the customer or the customer has no problem waiting until tomorrow morning um on, on rare occasions we're going out at night um but usually they'll wait till the next morning as long as they know what the expectations they just are. they just want someone to answer the phone right they want, right. To, they want they to, want to know that their first call tomorrow morning and then they're they're happy yep so and uh so a lot of folks uh start out in in the field uh working with their hands uh and some of them move into more managerial positions like yourself some succeed some don't 
Uh, did did you like that move? Did you like have the having the additional responsibilities of managing people? Yeah, you know what? When 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 a, a residential sales position was offered to me, um, this, this must be ni- nineteen ninety four somewhere in that range. I was like, "There's no way I could be a salesperson like that's <laughs> that's security. Like, <laughs> there's no way." But I, but also, I you know, I figured why 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 not take a chance? And if I don't like it, I just go back to being a technician. That's easy enough. So I I did, and um, I, I you know I gave it a I gave it a try, and um, I found out very quickly that it, it wasn't so much about selling; it was about problem solving again, mm-hmm. and um, and and really just coming up with solutions, offering to the customer. And they either buy or they don't. But um, but that was you know that was the the aha moment that um, you know there's there's a lot more to this career than just you know spinning a wrench. And um, the best move I ever made. And you know I I I've never felt like you know a quote unquote salesperson. I just I love talking about HVAC. I love solving problems. I, I you know I sit down with a customer. I walk around the house. I tell them you know what I would do. What I ask them what their expectations are, what they are looking for, um, and then I work up some options. And again, either they buy or they don't buy. But um, luckily, more more bought than didn't. <laughs> so, so here I am. So now you're a, a general manager, and you're in charge of both sides of the business, the sales and the uh, technical side. Uh, how do you train your staff to be good salespeople and be good technicians, especially as you mentioned earlier, the increasingly complicated equipment you're dealing with, right? Yeah. So on the technical side, you know, we have an eight week training program where we hire for attitude. So I'm looking for people with or without HVAC experience. Usually we're finding them without. Um, if you have a great attitude and you have a, a, a good work ethic, you know, you show us some customer service skills in the past working at a fast food restaurant or a supermarket or something like that, anything really. Um, and you have some mechanical ability. We, we go, we give a couple of mechanical aptitude tests. Oh, you got to tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it, what we use is it's called the, the Bennett Pearson mechanical aptitude test. And it's, you know, it's not about HVAC. It's more about just mechanical principles, gears, fulcrums, you know, leverage. Do you find that to be a reliable predictor of people with, some I, like I can, handiness. Yeah, I can definitely say that people that score highly in that will be very, will definitely be mechanically inclined. Mm-hmm. Um, the average score is fifty percent, of course, um, but it doesn't mean they're going to be a good employee. <laughs> so, oh yeah, so, if, if it were that easy, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely, um, definitely, it it, it 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 helps us make a decision, but uh, but that's not the only way we make a decision. Attitude. Attitude will overcome mechanical ability, you know, uh, a lot of times, but the mechanical ability certainly helps. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of our best technicians are just really good with people and people love them and they take their advice and, you know, and, and they might need some more technical support here and there, but but that, you know, a, a super mechanic that people hate is not a good recipe you know, it, no, just, you're in a, you're in a service business, right? You are, you are right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, obviously we're in the Boston area, so it's a, it's a, you know, probably a more affluent consumer yeah. and, and the expectations of service are high. Yeah. Yeah. What about the sales side? I mean, uh, you were alluded, you alluded to it earlier that you're solving people's problems, which means you have to have a fundamental understanding of the systems you're dealing with and potential yep. comfort problems, probably a, a basic understanding, at least of building science, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so our 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 best sales candidates are are maybe technicians that are um, that want to get out of the field that might have been good, um, you know, good good technicians that you know sold whatever service plans or replacement you know work or what what have you. Um, the training for for a, a salesperson, you know, the sales training is very a very small part of it. It's it, it, again, it's more about what, you know, having a conversation with a customer, it, whatever, sitting at the kitchen, you know, the dining kitchen table or dining room table and, and just talking to them about what their needs are. What, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish here? Uh, you know, what do you like? What don't you like about HVAC? A lot of times they don't know anything about HVAC. Right. Um, 
you know, what's aesthetically pleasing to them. You know, uh, I'm not going to start talking about ductless air conditioning if, if somebody doesn't want to see anything on their walls. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to talk about geothermal if your budget is $10,000. Um, so, um, you know, trying to find out what the budget is and, and not so that we take advantage of them, but just, I'm not, again, I'm not going to, not going to talk about high end systems if, if the budget isn't, isn't high end. Um, and, just having a conversation with them and, and, and finding out what their needs are. And then and then working up the options. Obviously, sizing equipment is important. What fits in the house? What doesn't? Are there any existing infrastructure that we're going to use? Or is it all going to get tossed out? Um, when you have problems with duct work or, as you describe it, infrastructure, like how do you have that difficult conversation with a client? Uh, <laughs> there's going to be some techs who come in and say it's fine, right? You can always find someone to just hook up a right. central unit to bad duck work. I'm sure. Yeah, no, that happens. That happens all the time. Um, you have you have it early and honest, and um, and you back it up with whatever facts you can. Yeah. Uh, but but a lot of people don't want to hear that because they you know they have a budget, and that's what they're going to spend. And and again, I, I can't tell you how many times you know we we meet somebody where whatever. 50% higher than somebody else. They have the work done. And then lo and behold, we get a phone call in six months that, <laughs> Hey, I really like you guys. And, uh, you know, and I should have went with you, but I didn't. And can you help me now? And, and what do you say? It, it, absolutely. We'll help yeah. you. Um, but you know, now, now you're paying me to demo what the other guy put in and then I'm going to put in what I said was going to do the first place. Ago. And, you know, so, but again, I you know I get it. There's a budget, mm-hmm. but HVAC, HVAC done cheap is never pretty. You might be lucky, but it, but but usually not. Yeah. So, what do you think the biggest challenges are as general manager of uh, the company right now? Um, finding and retaining talent. Yeah. Um, you know we 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 do why our- why I mean like is it that your trade specifically or is it just a bigger problem than that. No, yeah, it's definitely a bigger problem. It's it's the you know it's it's the trades in general, of course. Um, so that's a that's an issue. You know why? Um, you know, working from home is a is an issue now. Um, you know why why go out there and, and work in the in the field, working in strange strangers' homes, in the cold and the in the in the rain. If you you can get the same money, you know, sitting on a couch, right? Um, my wife works from home, so I'm not disparaging people that work from home, but it's it's a challenge to us. We, we, technicians will never work from home. Right. Um, so like, <laughs> I bet they wish they could, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, so that's that's an that's a new challenge. Um, you know, pay. Um, even though I think our technicians and our really all of our employees, I think, are are, are very well paid. Um, we're competing with, you know, um, maybe some of the trade unions in the area. We're, we're competing, you know, with uh, with other with other HVAC companies. And I, I, I talked to you about uh, the, you know, the private equity getting into HVAC. So, you know, now now my my HVAC company is competing with you know hundred million dollar companies that have deeper pockets. Do you want to and, briefly explain uh, that to our listeners, like you did to me, if you don't mind? Yeah. So, you know. Um, this is this is a a trend that we've we've seen before and in um, you know and, and it might be happening in other trades I don't know um, I, I I know it's happening in insulation because I I hired an insulation company recently that's part of a much bigger H, insulation company so but anyways private equity has noticed HVAC is profitable or can be profitable if done well um, so they you know these these private equity um, funds are buying up. HVAC companies and bundling them into, you know, bigger portfolios with the idea so that, they, that are they buying up like mom and pop shops or like bigger companies like yours? Usually, usually it's going to be a, a company that's probably, you know, 3 million up uh. Uh, that's got, you know, systems in place that that's actually a company and not just a, you know, a, a trades a, a person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so so that's what we're seeing, but you know, but uh, there's a lot of money going into it. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out uh, over time. Um, you know, we obviously know people that are 
in those businesses now um, because it's a, you know it's a pretty tight knit industry in our area anyways and so we we all talk and um, so it'll be very interesting to see how it, how it, it goes but I, I would imagine it for the consumer it's probably going to end up with increased costs because um, you, you and, get, and as an employee you're working for a huge a uh, company now, right? Or is it, is that it, change? It, well, no, you, you would be, and, but that can be good or it could be terrible. I, I guess it really depends on what the, what the company. culture of that company is, you know? So it could, it could go either way. I think for the employee, uh, I, I, there's certainly some opportunity there for somebody to move up the, a bigger ladder, I guess. Sure. Yeah. So, well, we'll be right back uh, after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the fine home building pro talk podcast is brought to you by jobber. If you run a home service business like painting, contracting, lawn care, cleaning, your to-do list is endless. From hiring staff to mountains of paperwork, not to mention doing the actual work that pays the bills. Jobber is a mobile and online app that helps you organize your business and look professional. With Jobber, you can quote jobs, schedule your crew, invoice, and get paid all in one place. Try it free today at getjobber.com slash finehomebuilding. I think one of the biggest criticisms among people who build high performance houses or listen to this podcast or read FHB or GBA that they have about the HVAC business mm-hmm. is that too many companies in tech still rely on rule of thumb sizing and bad duck work, right? Um, it's clear to me your company's trying to do a good job. How do you pick equipment and design the distribution system so it's quiet, comfortable, and isn't some of the bad behaviors that you talked about in your email to the podcast. Yeah. Well, I think it starts, obviously it always starts with proper sizing, you know, doing a manual J doing a room by room calculation. Can I guess you guys use software to do that? And everybody does now. Well, I, I can't speak for everybody, but we, we, we use most companies, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. We're using right soft and, um, doing is it manual. good? I mean, cause one of the complaints I've heard is, you know, uh, there are built-in fudge factors, even with the best software. Is that true? Yeah, you know, the old adage of, you know, bleep in and bleep out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you gotta, you got to obviously do a, a, a survey as best you can of the house. And, you know, and it's, it, there's, there's always a judgment call on how tight the house is. No, you know, nobody that I know of. As an it's doing a blower door or, test, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. happening. Um, it, it, not to say we 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 have a blower door d- test, you know, machine here. There's no reason why we we couldn't. It's not it's not practical. It's not it's not going to happen unless somebody, you know, uh, is willing to pay for that. Right? To, yeah, yeah. somebody has to pay for that. But um, but definitely sizing is is critical. Um, you know, for us, um, for us, you know, choosing equipment comes down to usually support. Um, you know, in my opinion, most equipment is equal. You know, you pick one of the major brands, it's going to be fine. It, how it gets installed is going to be the key as to how um, reliable it is, how comfortable it is, how efficient it is. Um, so, you know, we always we always lean towards where can I get the support? Um, you know, where can I get that support on Christmas Eve? Can I call somebody and say, hey, Bob, I got a problem. I need a new condenser and I need it now or whatever. And and I want I want to be able to get that type of that level of service from my vendors. If you sell every product under the sun, you're probably not going to get that. And I think that's where a lot of HVAC companies fall down is they sell everything because that's what the customer wants. And now you get, you know, you're, you're trying to support, you know, 10 different manufacturers. You spread your your sales out over ten different manufacturers. You know you don't have any. You know you don't have a, a, a strong support network. You don't have any leverage. And you know yeah. when you scale, when you get to be the size we're at, which again is probably I would say you know medium sized, in the in the in the you know the big world, um, you have to be able to get great support if you're going to give great support to your customer. So, Has it been challenging to get repair parts and equipment with the uh, pandemic? Yeah, we haven't had as big a problem. There's certainly some holes in, you know, the manufacturers that we deal with. There's certainly been some holes in their inventory that we've had to fill, you know, here and there with maybe maybe higher end or lower end equipment, depending on what the customer was looking for. Um, you know, we, we, um, we might want to go with a different, um, you know, uh, 
sometimes we, we, we might have to go with a different brand, but we, you know, we, we're very thoughtful about just, you know, another thing I read on the, on the forums is, you know, everyone, everyone is, you know, thinks that whatever, you know, there's a, there's a, a new product made in Canada and it's the best because it does dehumidifying and humidifying and, you know, it, it, you know, destroys ozone and it, and it'll keep every room at, you know, 70.3 degrees and, and it's cheap. And, you know, that, that product doesn't exist. Um, you know, if we're, we're usually sticking with the major manufacturers and, you know, right or wrong, if, if they're not into it, there's probably a reason. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. We, Cause we they have away. an interest in having, you know, stuff people want, right? Yeah. We, we stay away from the latest and the greatest. Let somebody else experiment with their money. I think that's good advice. Yeah. Um, I think the outbreak has reminded us about the importance of good indoor air quality. Have you guys seen a change in your business related to the pandemic? Are people telling you they want better filtration in their homes or businesses? Yeah, not as much as I thought I, we would. Um, we certainly have been selling more, you know, um, filters and ionizing um, uh -huh. devices to, you know, kill germs and bacteria and what have you. Um, definitely saw an uptick in that, but not as much as I would think. Um, you know, we've always been, we've always been pretty good with IAQ. You know, all of our, even our standard installations get, um, you know, whatever, four or five inch thick mechanical air filters. So big, thick, you know, whatever, 13, MERV 13 filters. I bet that's a change you've seen in your career. Like we used to have like a disposable right. filter stuck yeah. in an open housing. Well, the, the interesting thing is, is that, uh, you know, people can do harm with filters, um, especially some of the one inch thick pleated filters that you see a lot at the big box stores. They're probably doing more harm than good. They, they, they obviously filter air very well, which is great, but they're also very restrictive. So they can hurt, they can hurt furnaces, especially uh, maybe some air conditioning units. They get too um, hot or they freeze up, right? Yeah, we see, we see, you know, uh, an awful lot of cracked heat exchanges. I'm not saying just for that reason. It's probably yeah. more more so for oversizing and ductwork that's too small or poorly done. But those filters are not helping anything either. So, um, you know, whereas big, big, thick filters have a lot less pressure drop across them. Hmm. So, but you can't buy those you know, at the big box store. Huh. So. so what's the, like, highest MERV you think someone should put in their, like, conventional furnace that's not made for well, again, a wider filter yeah again it really comes down to what other accessories are on that system and what's the what's the the you know the static pressure capability of that appliance that it's on you really have to look at the whole picture you can't i can't really say that one you know you can you can you can install x yeah because you know you you might have the the worst duct system in the world that really one of those one of those what we call those rock catcher you know, the 99 cent filter is really the only thing you can put in there because that's the only thing that allows enough air through it mm -hmm. because everything else is so tight or, you know, poor, I should say. Right. I keep hearing we'll need to move away from fossil fuels in the future to get our carbon emissions in check. And I know Massachusetts is already uh, taking the lead in this and talking about it at a minimum. What do you think about the switch away from fossil fuels in a predominantly heating climate in a cold place? Is is it going to happen? Are we going to able to do it? Um, well, we can certainly do it. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, you know, um, it's funny how when I when when I, I agreed to the you know the podcast, how I started thinking about how my career changed. You know, and <laughs> over the thirty four years, and and you know, heat pumps are nothing new. They've been around, you know, since my my whole career, and you know, probably came into the residential world in the '70s, and um, and when I started in the late '80s, people hated them, um, and, and they hated them because they delivered cool air, right? And right, uh, and they were perceived as being very expensive because it's electric heat, right? And we and we didn't know anything about them as HVAC people, so we probably you know did our part with making people hate them. <laughs> um, you know, obviously nowadays with um, you know with some of the Japanese brands. Um, you know, they really do a great job and it, and it really is great equipment. Um, but, you know, getting back to the sizing, um, you know, there's, there's very little wiggle room um, if there's no, you know, with a, with a standard unitary type of, uh, heat pump, you, get, you usually have an electric heater in the ductwork that's going to supplement. You know, you don't have that when you get into the ductless units, usually, unless you have ducted air handlers, mm -hmm. which is, you know. 
um, more unusual. But um, so there's very little wiggle room. And, you know, if something isn't maintained well, if it's if it, you know, maybe is on the small side or even if it's sized 100 percent correctly, um, you can have a cold day where it goes below that. And and people are funny. They'll, they'll tell you that that's OK. I understand that this is designed for seven degrees in our area and sometimes it gets to zero, but that's OK. But when it gets to zero, they're not OK. <laughs> I can I can tell you they're not OK um, because they call here. So, you, you know, you, you have to be careful. Again, I, I'll i be the first to admit you shouldn't oversize anything. But don't do anything dumb either, because sometimes it's it is worse than the design day. And um, and people when when, when somebody spent twenty thousand dollars on a heating system and it's not heating even for a few hours a year, they're not happy. Um, so you got to be careful. I, uh, I, what I think about when we have these conversations is, is the expense, uh, who the heck's going to pay for swapping over all of our infrastructure from natural gas where you are or where I am yeah, uh, I to, care. to run everything off electricity. Well, I don't care about that as much because hopefully they're going to pay me. But, um, but <laughs> what I'm concerned about is that where is the, you know, and again, I don't want to get too controversial here, but will the grid support it? You know, yeah. um, Massachusetts is giving away an awful lot of money starting this week, really, you know, up to $10,000 or more per house that if they pull out a fossil fuel appliance and put in heat pumps, and that's great. But, you know, once all that gas goes away, can the grid handle it? And will the grid handle it via renewables? You know, uh, nuclear is one thing, <laughs> uh -huh. but, but, you know, is the grid going to support it? Because I don't see a plan to strengthen the grid. I see a plan to remove fossil fuel appliances. Where's the plan, which I would think would be the biggest infrastructure plan in the world, in our time anyways, where is it? I haven't seen it, but maybe it exists somewhere. I don't know. But What do uh, folks think about who have been installing gas furnaces and boilers for decades? Uh, you know, do they see this happening, do you think? We talk about it and we comment about it, but I, I won't say any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there because especially- and I can't imagine that gas utility is very happy about it. How, how, how the heck does that work? Well, I, I, I'm not sure what the politics are behind the scenes with a lot of this stuff, but we, you know, we been around long enough to, to see that if it doesn't really make sense to you or to me, then it probably doesn't make sense. But again, I'm, uh, you know, I, there's people a lot smarter than me that, you know, working on these things. Right? So I, you know, I just, I just sell HVAC and, you know, live my life. So on the subject, can you tell me about your own house? Do you have any comfort issues you're willing to disclose? I'm actually building a house. Um, and. Uh, Cause you don't have enough stress in your life. Well, I, you know, we're, we're at a point in our lives where the kids are grown up and I need, huh? I, I, I need something to do. So we're building a, a, a second home that might be our primary home at some point. Um, so it's a timber frame with sips Neat. and doing it, doing it myself or ourselves. And, um, so, um, I have a new, a new appreciation for, for home builders and what they go through. And, um, so, so that, that heating system is very comfortable and I'm ha very happy with it. But, <laughs> Uh, how, how is the, uh, what has been the biggest surprise with building your own place? Um, pro probably the, the, the choices, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, I want, I want a durable building. Um, and there's just a million different choices you could make, obviously. And, you know, which, and, you know, th that's probably surprised me is just how, you know, it, it and I'm kind of a more of an impulsive person. So at some point I, you know, I put in the research and then I'm like, all right, I just, I'm, I just going to pick one and I'm going yeah, to whatever, build this house. Whatever I, get, I, I, yeah. I got to move this process along, you know? I, so, um, so, and, and obviously I'm, I'm building this on the weekend, so it's going to be two years this July. So it's uh, taking a long time. Yeah. But do you enjoy it though? I mean, do you uh, I do. like, yeah. Working with yeah. your hands. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I, I've, I've subbed out what I've needed to sub out. But but everything else I'm I'm doing myself and my wife is helping out as well here and there. But 
Um, so yeah, is she enjoying the process or is she starting to hope it's over soon? No, it's at a point now where, you know, we're just doing interior, just fin finished carpentry. I'm doing some stairs and some cable railings at this point. And, um, she's doing painting and, um, you know, we got a warm shower, we got heat, we got, you know, all the floors are in. So it's, it's comfortable enough at this point where if I did go up there for a weekend and didn't do anything, uh, I wouldn't feel terrible about it. But yeah, um, but it's probably going to be another couple of years of, you know, of messing around with various little projects. Well, speaking yeah. from my own experience, I think that is the exact perfect time frame, honestly, because then you can enjoy it. You know, it doesn't have to be like bone soul crushing work every weekend. Right. It's, you know, yeah. it's when it's enjoyable. Yeah. You get time for a quick building perform a quick uh, uh, problem uh, that, that I found. Lay it on me. The uh, you know obviously with sips you want to make sure that you get a you get a, a a ventilated ventilated rain screen on the walls and the the roof you know I went with a cold roof so I have a you know ventilated airspace above the sips with a metal roof and um, last winter I was I was working there I was alone cold day in the twenties and it snowed the night before and I was drinking my coffee and the water it was water dripping off the roof. A metal ventilated roof should be really cold right now because it's below freezing and there's no sun out yet. And why is there water pouring off my roof? Can I guess? Yeah, go ahead. I bet you had air leaks between your sit panels and it was condensing somewhere up there. Uh, no, um, they didn't vent the roof. So so the metal roof guys didn't, they, they gave me a, a, a ventilated cap, but they ran the metal so it was touching at the at the ridge. So there was no ventilation space that I had mm. left them to, you know. Um, you got to watch those guys. Well, yeah. So I obviously I, I called them and we went back and forth. No, no, it's vented. I, I just, well, send me a picture because I'm not going up there myself. So, we, but we we got to the spring of 21, and you know, I I owed them enough not money. Luckily, that we got a lift and we went up there, and sure enough, it wasn't vented. And um, so I can say that this winter. Everything's working like it should. The snow's sticking on there and the roof is nice and cold. And but if I didn't know about building, you know, uh, you know, uh, building science, uh, who, who would have known that, you know? Yeah. And it so, might have not shown up until years later. Right. And no easy fix when I paid them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a that was a, a troubling one. But luckily I caught it in time. So. Anyways, what do you think? Would you say to what would you say to someone who is considering HVAC as a career move, either someone as a second career or as a, a young person? Well, I would say it's the you know, if you're looking for opportunity, it's endless. Um, you know, I've I've literally been around the world, um, been lucky enough to visit manufacturers, you know, and go on trips, and um, and you know, the the fact that I spent 34 years at one company. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a great company, but it, but it's also because another door opened, you know, at the right time and I was at the right place. And, and that's the, the great thing about the business. And, you know, um, and again, all the trades and, you know, I, I, I think are great. Um, it's just that, you know, obviously I'm partial to HVAC, the fact that it doesn't go, it doesn't go away. People need heating and cooling. It's going to continue to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking for a, a, a challenge and, and, and you, 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 you want to continue to move up, I, I, you know, it's, it's really been great to me. So, and so. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Rich. Is there anything else you'd like to tell or ask our audience before we, before we go? No, I, I think, I think, you know, some, some HVAC advice, if you're, you know, if, if you're hiring somebody, um, you know, just try to vet them as best you can. You know, what, what, what do their reviews say? You know, can you talk to some of their, I know, I know nobody wants to call references and you always get a question whether or not the references are any good anyways. Right. Um, but you know, if, if, if they're really, really cheap compared to some larger companies, you really want to, you know, you Dig really want to find out why you, you might get really lucky and maybe they priced it wrong or you might be getting a really, really cheap job <laughs> that you're going to yeah. regret. So as with anything else in life, you get what you pay for you pay a lot for. of times. So, well, it has been a pleasure talking to you, Rich. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Patrick. It's been great. And for the record, I don't ever think I said you guys were uncouth. I might've said the <laughs> other things, but 
That was my word. <laughs> Sometimes well, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Rich Labor for joining us and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at Taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Keep your filters clean. Bye.